some stuff on the bottom of the um, ground. <laughs> they climb to the top and they're searching for um, heat and they're looking for a host, right? So that will become uh, more significant. We'll talk more about that later, which by the way, I hate it when speakers said that. But since we're on the first slide, I thought that'd be okay. So. <laughs> um, all right, so we're going to talk about a couple of case presentations, and then we'll kind of go on more into the <clears throat> actual meat of the presentation. So the first one was a, an actual case. I can't remember if I told you guys. My husband's a family practice doc, so this was actually his patient. 55-year-old uh, gentleman in hunting. He actually did remove a tit. A couple of days later, at about 2 o'clock, he had this abrupt onset of a headache. And he was kind of tired, a little bit nauseous. He went ahead and went home from work. And then he started throwing up. His wife called him, and she thought, he's just not making sense on the phone. So she went ahead and called 911, and they came and picked him up and took him to the hospital. The next day, he was released from the hospital after some antibiotics for his bronchitis, because that's always appropriate, right? Bronchitis is definitely bacterial, so you want to give them some antibiotics. That's not a church environment. And um, they told him he was dehydrated. Um, okay, I'm not going So then a couple of days later, he went to his PCP. He had a rash on his palms and soles. That's not normal. Anytime you see that, you're going to think first and foremost of tick disease. Um, he did mention that had began the, the rash had begun the day before that. And so he was admitted. The day uh, he was admitted to the hospital for what we would assume was Rocky Mountain spotted fever. While he was in the hospital, he had intermittent confusion, which you guys are going to know as delirium. He had a pretty good temperature up to 103. He had thrombocytopenia. I don't know where you guys are at in your studies. Do you guys know what that is? Okay, so with that, low platelets. Okay. And you guys are going to know this antibiotic really well by the end of this lecture. He was given IV doxycycline. The rash continued to increase for about 24 hours. But after that, it began to improve. His headache got better. His platelets began recovering. And so he was ultimately released from the hospital. So we had a good outcome from this case. Okay. This one, not so much. This one I took from the literature. So on the 7th, this little boy came to his PCP, he had a 102 temp, kind of vague um, symptoms, headache, muscle aches, diarrhea. He did have a macular rash, um, but it was kind of diffuse. Arms, legs, but he did have palms and soles. Again, anytime you see that on the palms and the soles, what are you guys going to think? You're going to be suspicious of tick disease, especially if you're here in Oklahoma. Um, he even had a history on July 1st, six days before, of the tick removal. A lot of times we aren't going to have that. Um, nonetheless, he was diagnosed with a viral illness. Um, then three days later, the symptoms continued to progress. And they said, ah, oh, it's just a bacterial thing, you'll be fine. And then he got worse, though. He was admitted to the hospital with, again, dehydration. Um, irritability, confusion, and low platelets. Unfortunately, he developed DIC. Do you guys know what that is? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. He was given at that point doxycycline for what they thought finally was Rocky Mountain spotted fever. He didn't get better though. Mm -hmm. He developed gangrene from the DIC, got a uh, limb amputation, his uh, esophagus and the upper part of his stomach were removed and ultimately mm -hmm. died. So I've, I've I bring these two cases um, to the front of the lecture because I want you guys to understand the importance of diagnosing it. You are key to this disease, okay? So without the diagnosis, it has a very high mortality rate. All right, so here's the outline for our lecture. We're gonna start with talking about tick-borne disease. This stuff, like just the, I have two zoology degrees, so I think it's particularly cool. That was before I went to PA school. Um, no, I doesn't mean I like them. <laughs> I just think they're cool to study. Um, then we'll talk about uh, the diseases.
So they have multiple stages in their life cycle. They start out as an egg, which hatches into the very teeny larvae, uh, which then changes into a nymph and finally an adult. Each one of those requires a uh, blood um, a feeding. So um, the adult lays the eggs, they, the eggs hatch into the larvae. The larvae feed, they will change into a nymph, feed again, change into an adult. So um, each one of those, um, you can see the size of them on the fingertip in that bottom picture. Um, this next picture gives you an idea of how many eggs could be laid at a time. <laughs> that was pretty impressive. So um, we were out looking at some land one time and we'd taken our children with us and I remember my son saying after we got back in the car, there's something on me and we're like, ah, oh, you'll be fine. And he's like, no, really, I think there's something on me. And he was just, you know, like maybe this time, the time. And so finally we were like, okay. So I, you know, we turned around and looked and oh my gosh, he had clearly walked through one of these where they were just hatching. And I mean, we had to, we were in the middle of nowhere. So like I said, it was just land. And we had to take him, his clothes down to his underwear and just take our hands and do this no. to get all of these little nasty crawlies no. really off of him. He had hundreds, maybe thousands on him. Okay, he still remembers that. Uh, okay, so let's talk about their behavior. So I mentioned in that video earlier that it's questing and that they're um, detecting heat. They're also detecting movement and carbon dioxide. And um, so the, once they've attached, or sorry, once they've, once they've found a host, then they kind of wander around the body looking for a good site to actually attach. And it's interesting because they don't do that real quickly. Okay? They may actually wander around the body for a while, 24, 48 hours, before they attach. It's important to know that because a lot of people think that if they found a tick, then they've been bitten. And if it's only been an hour, since you found, or since you were out camping, um, it can't be even out for a while. <laughs> if you went to the park an hour ago and you came back and you just found the tick, more likely than not, it hasn't fed. So um, just know that they will walk around your your body, your body, whatever, for a while before they will attach. An important statistic also to know: one percent of tick bites usually uh, result in infection. So um, it's a very low statistic. I love these um, pictures because they're so interesting. Um, in the bottom of the picture, I describe it as an anchor and a straw. So they use these little arms to help push deeper into the skin, and they bury that um, thing with barbs on it into our skin. And um, when they attach, they alternate sucking your blood with um, regurgitating is a nice term, back and forth, okay? So it is not a one-way transmission. The importance of that is they're putting things into their host, okay? All of these different things can be transmitted into the host. Neurotoxins to help um, anesthetize the host, maybe that will help the uh, host not feel what they're transmitting or feel the anchor going in, um, anticoagulants to help ease the blood go in more quickly. They are putting in um, immunosuppressants, anti-inflammatories, and of course what we're concerned with in this talk, all of the potential pathogens. Um, and it doesn't have to be just one, right? So you can potentially get more than one pathogen <laughs> through any one tick, as well as toxins, and we'll talk about that as well. I didn't mention in this picture that each one of those is species specific, so that's one of the ways that they can tell them apart too. So that's why each of those looks so different. All right, risk factors. It's just going to be exposure related. So the more you're out in the woods, um, rolling in the grass, the more likely you are to get a uh, tick bite. Uh, also, it's going to be the year, the time of year. So, um, peaks in the summer. I put this slide in here, um, this is interesting. In the top slide, you'll see that it's, um, there are certainly 
areas of the U.S. that have a higher incidence of tick um, presence. If you go to the bottom, you'll see that that presence has significantly increased in uh, the locations over the U.S. So, um, for example, the red would probably is the um, black-legged tick, the um, Zotus scapularis, and um, that's Lyme disease. So. One of the interesting things about that is, we talked about questing, right? Mm -hmm. So, they're worried that there's going to be a much larger incidence of Lyme disease as the uh, prevalence of its carrier is increasing in the geographic regions of the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. But what they're finding is, it's not really the case. So they've done some studies and they found that the ticks in the northern parts of the U.S., are much more, um, they have a higher questing rate, where the ones in the southern parts are really, they just kind of hang out in that leaf litter much more. They're not climbing to the top and doing that questing um, like the ones in the north. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Don't really know why, but there, there is a lot more um, prevalence of those ticks across the U.S. And I, I'm putting that out there because I'm hearing more and more about the prevalence of, you know, Lyme is a, well, it's just everywhere, because everyone has Lyme, and it's all over Google, and um, I still hear patients come, I, I've got Lyme. It's not an open line. So, um, note that in this, it is not Lyme disease. It's, this is the distribution of ticks, okay? That is not, clearly that does not correlate with, with disease prevalence, okay? All right, since I heard you guys were furry class, furry lovers, these are mine. The one in the top left is mine, that's my cat. Um, that's Hope. The right, although they look remarkably similar, is my son's cat, and she does not like the bed. She does not like the bed. Every time she goes, this is what she does. And I cracked me up this time, she managed to get a paper towel on top. So she did particularly good hiding. This time. Anyway, that's nice. And of course, we have the six month old trouble. Okay, so I just have to share this story because it cracks me up. So we're in Cub Scouts, and I get all these Cub Scout applications that I have to go turn in. Addie is on the bottom. So I put them on my desk, and Addie, because she, like my office is her place, she just went in and took these applications, like, like it's her place to do that, and chewed them up. And so we find like these little pieces of these applications. We have to put them together like it's a puzzle to figure out which ones should shoot up. So we found them. I had duplicates. I took them to the office, Cub Scout office. And he knew they were duplicates. And so I didn't say anything. So I wasn't. And he says, So you didn't have the originals? I really had to say, My dog took them. <laughs> So every year, we in Oklahoma are in the top third of cases um, in the U.S. So that's why I say, Russian and souls, you guys know, you got to pay attention. So um, it's important, regardless of if they have the tick history, because up to a third of these cases do not have that. It has a 1.4% overall mortality rate. But if they go untreated, up to a third of these patients will die. So, very significant mortality rate without treatment. Classic presentation, so if it's on a test, um, high fever, headache, and a particular rash, the giveaway on the textbook if they have the history of tick This is kind of the distribution that you'll see across the U.S. where it, occur, where it occurs. So, all right, the bacteria it's associated with. Everyone has to say it really fast because it's fun as Rickettsia rickettsii. It's a gram-negative bacteria, so it's an obligate intracellular parasite, which is also kind of fun to say. All it means, obligate means that it has to, intracellular, live within the cell. And of course you guys know what parasite is, so. With tropism, again, it just means likes. We're human endothelial cells. Endothelial is the lining of. So we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Rickettsia are transmitted to humans when the tick is feeding. 
So um, I'll just show you some pictures in a sec. Anyway, these are the ticks that transmit that bacteria, and it kind of depends on which part of the U.S. you're talking about. If you're in family practice, you will see these in the block bags or napkins, whichever they decide to bring in. So this is the pathophysiology. How does how do you get from the bacteria in the saliva of the tick to the pathophys, the disease? So the tick is attached for several hours. The bacteria enter the skin of the host plus. It spreads through those lymphatic channels into the bloodstream. Once it's inside the bloodstream, it goes straight to those endothelial cells, those cells that are lining the blood cells, and then it's going to multiply throughout there. Once the, those blood cells, those lining the blood cells are kind of full, they're going to open up. When that happens, those cells are going to die. But you can't have that vascular cell, um, that blood tube, as my son calls them. <laughs> Enjoy that. Um, you can't have that blood tube not lined well, right? What's going to happen when those cells break open? What's going to happen to the blood inside? It's going to leak out. And when it leaks into the surrounding tissues, then you're going to end up with the next and last step in the pathway that I've drawn, small vessel thrombi, blood clots and obstruction, right? And fluid leakage resulting in edema. And another step in that is going to be hypovolemia, low blood volume, and low blood pressure. Okay, everyone follow that? So here's my picture. Um, okay, so this here, all of the, can you guys see that? You can see me using that name. Okay. So, Okay, so you guys, this part over here, that's where the blood flows, right? So all of these little dots are the bacteria, all of those little guys. And so, like, in here is where we have a rupture, okay? And these are some that are about. Rupture. Um, so this is where it's starting to leak out. Barely tall enough. <laughs> so that's um, kind of the pathophysiology of the tropism for vascular endothelial cells. Um, does all that kind of make sense? and symptoms, other than the rash, well, no, I guess the, the fevers, you're going to have a high fever with this one. It's not going to be the 99 kind of stuff. It's going to be a high fever and that um, abrupt headache. Those are kind of your telltale signs. The other stuff is going to be kind of vague, okay? Um, thus, the comment at the bottom, blue light. So, incubation period is about a week. All right, so let's talk about this rash. It is in most patients, so about 90% of patients are going to have this rash. Um, it appears about three to five days after you get bit with the tick. It is blanching, it's red, and it's macular. Um, if it persists, it can, it can become petechial. Uh, I mentioned that it's on the palms and soles, it can, it can spread from there. So just like that little boy had it kind of on his um, diffusely, he did not just have it on his um, palms and soles. So one thing to keep in mind in patients who are darker skinned may not see it. So think about that to you. You'll notice at the bottom that 10% of patients that you may not see it in the Rocky Mountain spotless fever. So, um, all right, so here's some examples also of just more pictures of it. Um, all right, so what, what is your differential uh, viral illness? If, when you add the ration, 
with the exception of um, the palms and the soles, you're really going to just be thinking about a multitude of viral illnesses that cause rashes. So I just think some that are known for that. And some of those you know, really are distinctive rashes. So if it's disease has the slack cheek uh, appearance. So. All right, so lab detection. There is no widely available uh, test that will tell you right away, this is Rocky Mountain. Okay, so that's really important because if you are suspicious, you just have to treat them. You can't wait for confirmation to treat them. So there are lab findings that can help you um, be more um, concerned that, that it really is. Like we talked about with the low platelets, the another thing is elevated liver enzymes. You can have hyponatremia or low sodium. We kind of went through that earlier, how you end up with the hypovolemia. Um, so if you think about it, it is a dilutional hypervolemic hyponatremia. Um, but that's only about half of patients. So. There is the um, Rickettsial IFA test. This is the one recommended by the CDC and those state health departments. You do have to, if you get a positive, you have to um, turn it into the state health department. Most of the times, anytime you get one of these uh, reportable tests, so um, some sexually transmitted diseases are reportable. This, has anybody ever talked to you guys about that stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so I'll take it. Um, all right, so the IFA test detects antibodies in the blood samples, but unfortunately they, they don't appear until about a week into the illness, so again, you can't wait for these to appear to treat. Confirmation is going to include a fourfold increase in the titers. Okay. So one thing though is if they've had it before, you're still good, you're going to see antibodies present, right? So um, that's one of the reasons that you have to see an increase in titers for it to be a positive test. All right, so some other things that, um, some other testing options. One is immunostaining where you take a punch biopsy. So if you take a punch biopsy of the skin, let's think for a second, where is the bacteria, where do the bacteria live? Right, the endothelial cells or the blood vessels, right? So if you're taking a biopsy of the rash, you're not, you're not really getting it, right? So that's not very accurate. Um, sensitivity is only about 70%. That's why it's not recommended by the CDC. Blood cultures. Um, again, not very helpful because most of the bacteria are inside the endothelial cells. So, all right, so treatment. Cover this, you're not going to wait. You're going to treat them immediately because how many die if you don't treat them? What's the percentage? <laughs> Half huge compared to 1.4. <laughs> so um, treatment is going to be doxycycline, and you're going to treat them for more than three days after the fever subsides. Okay, so you're waiting for that improvement in symptoms. If they're not responding to doxycycline, then you got to start wondering if maybe you're not on the right track. Outpatient treatment, so we kind of talked about delirium earlier, but if there's no delirium, then maybe you can consider outpatient. Um, anytime there's something like that intermittent confusion, they're in the hospital. So, all right, adverse reactions of doxycycline. So it's really important to memorize this table, right? No, not so much. So there's just some things that you want to know about doxycycline, like the um, Esophagitis. Um, you want to make sure that when they take their doxycycline, they take it with a full glass of water because some medications are more uh, prone to causing difficulty or ulcers or um, soreness in the throat. Um, they don't take the, the glass of water and swallow it. So I usually tell the patients to do that. Um, another one is the tooth development. Doxycycline can cause yellow brown discoloration of tooth when the teeth are developing. So, as adults, our teeth are done. 
like it's not going to change the color of our teeth, but in kids, it will. So um, that's why it says do not use it in children under eight. However, um, oh, all right. So um, another thing is the photosensitivity. If they have Rocky Mountain spotted fever and they're going to Hawaii, you might want to let them know <laughs> they need a whole lot of sunscreen and they need to apply it frequently because they will burn. Okay. All right. So. Um, I mentioned the tooth discoloration for kids under eight. Well, if they have Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is more important? 30% mortality, mm -hmm. yellow teeth, right? So we're probably going to go ahead and give them doxycycline. And that's why the American Academy for Pediatrics and the CDC both recommend doxycycline. So. However, in other situations where doxycycline may be an appropriate treatment, we're really not going to offer that for kids if there are other options. So, for pregnant women, we offer them chloramphenicol, um, but it is IV. So, all right, complications of Rocky Mountain are going to be due to that vascular injury, those blood clots at the end. So, uh, DIC, skin necrosis, um, cardiac arrhythmias, and Usually, though, for diagnosing and recovery is complete. All right. You guys want a video? Yeah. Yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay, this is really one of my favorites. <laughs> Significant in the rash. 
it will spread through the lymphatic system or hematogenously through the, through the blood. I love lists like this. There is absolutely nothing specific here. Mm -hmm. So vague. Um, and this could be any number of viral illnesses. So vague. This is the key. Erythema migrans. Slowly expanding bullet bull's eye rash. Central clearing, maybe, maybe not. It's a week or more after the bite. It's usually not symptomatic. Okay? That's significant too. Because if it, it, it doesn't it doesn't really matter if you have a rash this big. If it's in your gluteal hole back here or on the back of your knee, if it doesn't hurt, doesn't itch, what are the chances that you're going to notice it if it goes away on its own? Right? Um, the average size is 15 centimeters. So it's a pretty good size. It's really significant that you guys remember that. 15 centimeters is big. There are not many rashes that are going to be that big. So it has a, a pretty distinctive um, appearance as well as size. If untreated, what does it do? That's not really so helpful for us. Because if it stayed around, chances are you would notice it. But it doesn't. All right, so here's some examples of it. And um, if you notice in the bottom um, picture with the This one. Um, so, what do you guys think? Did you get bit multiple times? Mm -hmm. I want to say yes, but your face tells me no. You were right. <laughs> so, remember we talked about it being spread in a couple of ways? It's hematogenous spread. So, look at the ones on his legs. Like, he would have had to have been bit, you know, I don't know, six times or something. So, no, it, it got in his blood mm -hmm. and spread. Been bitten six times, but eight. Mm -hmm. He counts ones on his back too. But no, those are all from bacteria spreading. So here's some more without that central clearing. So what do those look like? You guess. One go. They could. I mean, yeah. To me, that would look like a cellulitis, or. Yeah. But the key is none of those are going to be. Symptomatic. Those aren't going to hurt. There's some more. They just look a little different than the others, and that's why I put them on here. Um, there's such a variety in the presentations, but again, there's they're asymptomatic. So, can they itch? Well, there is. They could itch. I mean, are they going to itch a lot? That's not going to be very likely. That's going to change your differential. Okay. All right. So the stages of infection. Tell me something that has three stages of infection. Syphilis. All right. Bring that home again. And syphilis is a. There you go. All right. So there's the early localized stage, just days to a month after infection. And what are the two symptoms for that? The rash we just talked about, and then these, of course, very vague symptoms. After that, that rash is gone. And now we've moved into the, from the um, skin symptoms into the bloodstream. So we're going to have more system, systemic stuff. We've got the early disseminated stage weeks to months after infection. And these are going to be neurologic sequelae, cardiac disease, so facial palsy, meningitis, um, and they're going to be tired, really tired. Okay. Then we move into the late stage of the disease, and this is going to be months to years. These are going to be the patients that are um, looking on Google for the explanation for their symptoms, for their arthritis that moves around all the time, and it's going to be um, swelling in asymmetric joints. Um, the 
interestingly, it's usually the knee. So, um, their symptoms are usually going to resolve within a few weeks or a month of antibiotic. They're going to have a hard time convincing me that they have Lyme disease if they've never left Oklahoma, but I won't argue much. I would do a test with them. Blood test. Um, maybe. So, um, that acrodermatitis chronica trophic hands. Yes. So, um, I need to go Alright, so here's my husband. Let me put this in here. I love it. So there it is. Not typically seen in the US, um, but it's the progressive fibrosing, so their skin is actually kind of getting thicker um, from that um, infection is that in that latter stage of disease. So and one of the few one of the things that can get better. Alright, so differential diagnosis. Changing mole. So friend that works in Durham, absolutely, she's gone to remove a mole that wasn't a mole. You mentioned cellulitis, um, tinea, uh, like, we, like the gentleman that we saw earlier that had multiple lesions, um, can look like that. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the fixed drug eruption. All right, so in order to diagnose it, they have to have the rash and be in an endemic area. They're not happy with me on it. They've taken the p-test. Google told them to. All right, or they can have serology plus an extracutaneous, meaning non-skin, manifestation of Lyme disease. Their knee hurts. Google is amazing. Yes. Is this like a lifelong the stages, even if you treat it? Um, so I mean, if you treat it in like the the early stages, absolutely you can treat it as well. So that late stage and everything comes if it's not treated. It's tougher. In the, so the longer they have it, the harder it is to treat. So. don't want to use serology for screening. So maybe somebody went on a camping trip out in um, one of those really endemic areas and they came back and you're doing a physical one. Do you want to run a tick disease panel because that's where they were? Yeah. So they really need to have some symptoms uh, in order for you to do any kind of uh, serology. So the initial test that you're going to do is probably going to be an IFA, much like the one we talked about for Rocky Mountain. And similarly to um, Rocky Mountain, the antibodies are going to persist, so you have to have an increase. Um, you can have um, into the Western block for corroboration. You do get a positive. Um, oh yeah, here's the some of the ones that are mentioned on the internet that patients come in and request that you can with certainty say mm, there might be a better choice. So treatment. You guys know what antibiotic? It's going to be doxycycline. Um, and again, they're going to show a pretty good response within a few days, if they don't, then you're going to start wondering. Unless they're in those latter stages, those latter stages are more difficult to treat. So, there are alternative treatments if they're, say, allergic to doxycycline. Okay, Jarish Herxheimer. So, this is where that antibiotic is killing the 
bacteria, but now they're being released into the circulation. Okay, the, the bacteria is, um, and the result of that bacteria in the circulation is causing an intensification more of um, fast heart rate, um, low blood pressure, and so they start feeling worse. And they're like, I'm not taking that antibiotic, I feel worse, unless you warn them. So if you tell them, you may start feeling worse. And you know what, that's actually good, because that tells us we've got the right medicine. So if you warn them ahead of time that this may be the case, and that it's good, <laughs> then they may continue their antibiotic, and that it's temporary. <laughs> so um, that's a, a good idea in these cases. So. Um, and it's one more sign, of course, that your diagnosis is correct. So, all right. I mentioned earlier some of, some of those uh, symptoms may persist, and this just points out it's the neurological stuff and the arthritis, particularly that persists. So, there is the option of giving people um, a one-time dose of doxycycline to take with them if they're going into an endemic area. Um, and they have all of these um, tick boxes. But again, it's not okay for here. So, I've yet to do it. Okay, it's another video, but of a um, tick or louse infected with a different type of Borrelia, not the Borrelia burgdorferi, and it is not common at all, but it's very distinctive. So this one is um, somewhat easy to remember because you have um, acute episodes of very high fever, up to 106, followed by periods where the fever comes back down, and then it comes back up to 106 and comes back down, thus relaxing fever. Um, most of these patients will have been sleeping in some kind of really rustic cabin in western U.S. or faraway places like Canada, Africa, um, but uh, it's again very distinctive with that very high fever and then it comes back out and it comes back up. So um, diagnosis is by a, like a, a blood smear and actually seeing those bacteria in the blood, you're going to treat it with a variety of antibiotics and they do have to be treated um, quickly because of the damage that that really high fever can do and if you don't find the treatment, those patients are not going to do it. Associated rash illness. It's a Lyme like illness um, that is in Oklahoma, okay? But um, it doesn't have the long term sequelae that Lyme disease has. So, alright, the tick that it's associated with is the um, Lone Star tick. I love this. And it is aggressive. Watch out. So, it goes after us. It does have the Arachnid migrants rash, okay? It has mild symptoms, but it does not have the chronic arthritic or neurologic symptoms that regular Lyme disease has. Okay. It has a negative Lyme test, so even if we do the arthritis panel and check, it does not show up as a positive Lyme. You can treat them um, with a prospectocycline. What, what are you really going to treat though if the rash goes away? Maybe they're really mild symptoms, but there's no long term sibling that you're at risk for in this one. Alright, you can do this one without sound, so. And it's like 10 seconds. Yeah.
specific symptoms, but really got sick with this. Treatment. So again, those are, if they need treatment for this, they're going to be pretty sick. And that's not going to be a normal patient. So um, thus, the delay in treatment is going to be associated with increased rates of ventilation and longer hospital stays. These are not going to be your typical patients. Okay. So, and you're going to give them doxycycline, and if they're not responding to doxycycline, you're going to question your diagnosis. Mortality is going to be pretty low, and but that, I and mean, even these rates are going to be overestimates because so many patients aren't going to be showing up once they get the infection because they don't have any symptoms, right? That would follow that.